there's a strange phenomenon when a scientist gets his or her degree, whether it's a PhD or a master's or a bachelor's degree, that there's this mental switch where you turn in your citizenship papers, where you go into the lab and you talk to scientists and you don't talk to the public and you don't talk to policymakers and somehow you're not a citizen anymore. And my suggestion for this TED Talk is we need to change that. So historically, scientists are the keepers of the facts, according to Congressman Rush Holt. So we are the sage on the stage. We are the people who you consult when you want scientific information. So if you have a question, you need to talk to a scientist. Well, that's history. And as you all know, you're thinking, I don't talk to a scientist. I go to Google. If I need scientific information, uh, why is the sky blue? You totally Google it. Uh, I have these lumps in my throat. You Google you know, throat cancer or I have a cold. So the public these days absolutely goes to Google and the internet, which is this powerful driver for scientific information for everybody. The problem with the internet and all of this information availability plus social networks is we have what are called availability cascades. And what happens is someone makes a statement. My son got autism from childhood vaccinations. And the first time someone says that, you think, well, that's kind of silly. But the more it's repeated, the more it's uh, brought around, the more real it seems. So we get validation through repetition, not through evidence. And scientists lately have not been engaging in all of this discussion, so scientists end up in the audience rather than participating in the conversation. And scientists need to be part of the conversation so that we can remember that evidence does exist and it should drive policy. So in addition to being part of the dialogue, there's still a role for scientific experts. So we have certain types of training. We process data. We look at what the data tell us. Are the data biased? Or are they uh, well collected and they give us a good picture? Scientists are also uh, trained to evaluate risk and to evaluate statistics. So this is something that the general public tends to struggle with a little bit more. So in the 2014 Ebola outbreak, the public kind of freaked out. And there was the sense of, oh my god, I'm going to get Ebola. And scientists did OK, but we weren't good enough at talking about, all right, Ebola was never airborne. So you're not going to pick up Ebola like you get the flu or like you get a cold. So from a scientific perspective, the risk was very, very low. But from the public's perspective, they weren't really sure what kind of risk was OK. So the public generally doesn't look at statistics the same way that scientists do. And so we need to uh, be more active on engaging in that area. So. We're having a little bit of a stormy patch in Washington, DC. Most of the major public policy decisions that we are going to have to make in the foreseeable future for our generation have a scientific underpinning. Climate change, genetically modified organisms, delivering safe water. So we desperately need scientists to engage in policymakers to make sure that these decisions are made with good scientific knowledge. Now, one of the challenges of being a scientist and giving advice is that most politicians, they like to have a scientist in their pocket and say, this is what I think, and this scientist agrees with me. And what they're doing is they're hoping that the trust in the scientist transfers to the politician. Well, scientists run a risk of this. Because sometimes it works the other way. And so the public's distrust of the politician merges onto the scientist. So right now, you're looking at me. I'm a scientist. I'm giving a TED talk. You trust me. 
You put me in the Senate press gallery, and you see me completely differently. I'm still the same person, but as a TED speaker, I'm trustworthy. Over there, mm, it's a little more questionable. So for a scientist to be really good at helping out with public policy decisions, we need to give advice. And the key pieces are what do we know and how do we know it? It's important for scientists not to overstate what we know. It's important for us to also not suggest how to solve problems. Because that's when we become activists. And as soon as a scientist becomes an activist, they lose all the credibility of being a scientist. The other place that scientists need to re-engage as well is with the general public. So the idea of the scientist as the all-knowing expert, there's a smaller role for that. And what a scientist needs to do is to engage the general public. And the public doesn't want to be lectured at. My students don't want to be lectured at. You want to participate in the conversation. You want to ask questions. You want to throw around ideas. So this is the way the public is interacting with science these days. And that's the way scientists need to dive in. The other piece that scientists need to be aware of is the role of values. So science is the foundation for policy, but values are the driver. So one example I will give is dealing with climate change in the United States right now. So we have this intractable battle, not about the facts, but really about who people are. So you have, I value the environment versus I value the economy. And these two sides butt heads, and this is why we're not making any progress. So interestingly, in 2015, Pope Francis put out a document called the Papal Encyclical, or Our Common Home. And he talked about the environment, and he talked about the economy, but he also talked about people. Because if we don't do anything about climate change, the people who are going to be most affected by it are poor and in developing countries. And so by adding in this third piece, you don't have to be just someone who believes in the environment or someone who values the economy. Are you someone who values people? And I looked at this document and I said, maybe that's our way around. Maybe that's how we get beyond this fundamental friction and start making progress. But scientists have got to remember it's not just about the science. So scientists have this idea with climate change, well, if we just educate everyone, that'll make it perfect. And it won't, because it's about identity and it's about values. And scientists have to make sure they uh, value that as well. It's also about trust. So we used to be, scientists used to be trusted as experts. But now if we're going to be part of the dialogue, we need to build the trust with the public and with policymakers. And to do that, you have to tell the truth. You have to make sure that you have the best interests at heart of the people you're talking to. And this is where there are some studies that say that scientists are absolutely trusted. And there are other studies that say that their motivations are questionable. So if people aren't sure that scientists have their best interest at heart, then the trust falls apart. And so we need to work on making that trust. Scientists also have to be clear. So this figure is an example of something scientists should not do. I had a good time looking for bad science figures. So scientists need to make sure that they are speaking to the audience. So not talking to fellow scientists necessarily. Don't do jargon, jargon, term, term. You all know how that feels. It tends to be intimidating. It doesn't make you feel part of the discussion. And so communicating clearly at an appropriate level is one of the most important pieces in involving people and in developing trust. And I will give you one last example. So the pictures that you are looking at right now are ozone pictures. So they are four different years, and you're looking at Antarctica. 
So in the 1970s and the 1980s, it became apparent that every spring, the amount of ozone in the stratosphere over Antarctica dipped significantly. And it would recover, but every year it got low. And so what the scientists contributed was an understanding of the process, and they figured out what was going wrong. So the culprit were the chlorofluorocarbons that were used in aerosol cans and in refrigerators. And so the, that's where the science stopped. Here's what's happening. Here's why. So policymakers around the world got together, figured out what's the right step forward, and in 1987 signed the Montreal Protocol, which was the first step in eliminating CFCs globally and fixing the problem. So the two lower pictures on the slide are <laughs> the two lower pictures on this slide show that the ozone hole has stabilized. It's big, but it's stabilized. So that's 2006 and 2011. And what we expect is that it's not getting any bigger now. And over the next couple decades, it's going to recover and we'll go back to life before no ozone hole. So that's an example of science having a crucial role in policy development. So I believe that scientists absolutely have a responsibility to contribute their knowledge and their skills to public policy and to the general public. Scientists make great citizens. Thank you.